Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today's video has been heavily requested, so I've made it a priority, and it is the first of the second gen Ryzen exploration videos that I have planned. Since the release of the second gen Ryzen CPUs, many of you have been asking me for an IPC comparison with Intel's Coffee Lake CPUs. For those of you unaware, IPC stands for Instructions Per Cycle, and it is a good indicator of a CPU's performance. The Coffee Lake CPUs offer high IPC coupled with high operating frequency, and that really is the best combination for maximum performance. Although AMD is clearly trailing when it comes to frequency, they appear to have really closed up on Intel's IPC performance, and that's likely why many of you have been requesting this test. Before we get into the IPC comparison, this video has been sponsored by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, website, or online store, make it with Squarespace. For more information, please check the link in the video description. To see just how much headway AMD's made here, we're going to neutralize as many variables as we can, while also keeping things as realistic as possible. The first and most obvious step is to remove core frequency from the equation, and to do this we've locked all CPU cores at 4 GHz. Any type of boost technology has been disabled, the cores cannot go past 4 GHz, and all cores are again locked at 4 GHz. The second gen Ryzen CPUs have been tested on the ASRock X470 Tai Chi Ultimate, and the Coffee Lake CPUs on the ASRock Z370 Tai Chi. Both configurations used the same G-Skill Flarex DDR4-3200 memory using the Extreme Memory Profile, and the same MSI GTX 1080 Ti Gaming X Trio was used for all the testing. This is purely for a science type benchmark and is in no way buying advice. The Coffee Lake CPUs do have a clock speed advantage, there's simply no getting away from that fact, and for real world performance, please refer to our recent Ryzen 5 2600, 2600X and 2700X reviews. For this test, I've included results for the Intel Core i7 8700K, 8600K, Ryzen 7 2700X, 2600X, and Ryzen 7 1800X, along with the 1600X. Now, the 1600X, 2600X, and 8700K all have the same CPU resources, 6 cores with 12 threads. The 1800X and 2700X have an advantage being that they are 8 core 16 thread CPUs, while the 8600K is at a disadvantage because it's a 6 core 6 threaded CPU, so please keep all that in mind as we proceed. Right, so let's get to the results. Starting with the sustained memory bandwidth test, here we see that the first and second gen Ryzen CPUs are very similar with a bandwidth of around 39 gigabytes per second. Meanwhile, using the exact same memory, the Coffee Lake CPUs are limited to around 33 gigabytes per second, and this is a 15% reduction in bandwidth when compared to the Ryzen CPUs. Moving to the Cinebench R15 results, we see that the 2600X scores 4% higher than the 1600 for the multi-threaded test, and 3% higher for the single thread test. Then, as we look at the 8700K, we see that it is 4% faster than the 2600X for the single-threaded test, but 4% slower for the multi-threaded test. As you might have expected, clock for clock, the 8-core 16-thread Ryzen CPUs easily beat the multi-threaded score of the 8700K. I've included them simply because I had the results. Uh, depending on demand, I could update this test with the Core i7-7820X, for example. Next up, we have the PC Mark 10 video editing scores, and this is a more lightly threaded test, though we did previously see a noteworthy difference between the 1600X and 1800X. As a result, we see a solid 10% jump from the 1600X to the 2600X, and this places AMD on par with Intel in terms of IPC performance for this test. Like what we saw with the Cinebench R15 benchmark, uh, when maxed out, SMT appears to be more efficient than Intel's HT technology. Here the 1600X was faster than the 8700K by a 3.5% margin, while the 2600X was 8% faster, and that really is a noteworthy margin right there. Next up we have Excel, and here the 8700K was around 3% quicker than the 1600X when matched clock for clock. However, the 2600X is able to match the 8700K with the same completion time of 2.85 seconds, that's pretty impressive. The handbrake test we run doesn't leverage the AMD Ryzen CPUs that well, and here we see that the 2600X is only able to match the 8600K, and therefore is 15% slower than the 8700K. Moving on to the Corona benchmark, we see that the 2600X is able to reduce the render time by 8% when compared to the 1600X, and this meant it was just 3% slower than the 8700K. So Intel still holds an IPC advantage in this test, but it is very minor. 
Next up we have Blender and here the 2600X was just 2.5% quicker than the 1600X and this made it 4% slower than the 8700K. Not a huge difference and again while Intel still holds an IPC advantage in this test, uh, it is less than 5% now. Using the V-Ray benchmark, we see that the 2600X improves on the 1600X by a 4% margin, and that meant it was just a single percent slower than the 8700K, so basically on par here. Okay, so time for some gaming results, and this is where things come unstuck for AMD. As we've talked about in the past, Intel's low latency ring bus is just better suited for gaming, and we see this when comparing their own mesh interconnect architecture designed for the higher core count CPUs. The Infinity Fabric suffers the same problem as the mesh architecture, and it's not until gaming CPUs require way more cores that this problem will go away for AMD. So while the 2600X does improve on the 1600X by an 8% margin, uh, in ashes of the singularity, it's still a whopping 11% slower than the 8700K. Couple that with the fact that Intel CPUs clock much higher, uh, this can blow that margin out to over 20% at times. Moving on to Assassin's Creed Origins, and here we see a mere 2% increase for the 2600X over the 1600X, uh, while the 8700K is a further 14% faster. The margin is slightly reduced with the high quality preset, but still the 8700K is 12% faster than the 2600X when comparing the average frame rate. When testing with Battlefield 1 using the ultra quality preset, we see that the 2600X is 9% faster than the 1600X, but still 7% slower than the 8700K. The margin is completely blown out of the water with the medium quality preset as the GTX 1080 Ti is now able to better stretch its legs. Here the 2600X again offered a 9% increase over the 1600X, but is now 10% slower than the 8700K, which still appears to be GPU limited. It's a similar story when testing with Far Cry 5. The 2600X is again 10% faster than the 1600X, which is a huge improvement, but even so it's still 8% slower than the 8700K. Moving on to power consumption, and firstly, just let me quickly point out that this isn't the most realistic test, and many of the power are saving features are disabled in our 4 GHz clock for clock comparison. It's also not the most scientific because I have had to increase the voltages for the Ryzen CPUs above spec to stabilize an all core overclock of 4 GHz. So having said that, we see that the 1600X and 2600X systems consume the exact same amount of power. Meanwhile, the 8700K system consumed 3% less power, making it slightly more efficient under these test conditions. Power consumption when testing with Far Cry was much the same across the board. All CPUs pushed total system consumption to around 380 watts. Here we see a 10% reduction in power consumption when moving from the 1600X to the 2600X in our Blender workload. That is an impressive improvement for the 2600X, but even so, it still consumed 21% more power than the 8700K. Then finally, this time when testing with Handbrake, we see that the 2600X actually pushed total system consumption 7% higher than that of the 1600X, and a whopping 32% higher than the 8700K. Okay, so we just saw a number of interesting results. Uh, as we saw in the day one reviews, despite a rather large clock speed deficit, the second gen Ryzen CPUs aren't often that far behind their Intel rivals in application benchmarks. And here we see why that is uh, when comparing them clock for clock at four gigahertz. In application benchmarks, such as Cinebench R15, we see that the single core performance is down just 3%, but where SMT is well leveraged, AMD can be as much as 4% faster. We found that AMD was 3% slower in our Corona benchmark and much the same in our Excel, V-Ray and video editing tests. Then while it was 15% slower in our handbrake test, it was also 8% faster for the PC Mark 10 gaming physics test. Of course, there is still the matter of gaming, and I bet a few AMD fans were hoping we could put most of the gaming performance deficit down to clock speed. Sadly though, that isn't the case. One issue here is how AMD connects its cores, or rather the CCX modules. Intel's ring bus is a low latency method that always sees resources accessed via the shortest path. However, as you add more cores, the rings grow in size, and more rings are required to connect all the cores, and this sees efficiency go out the window. There's more to it, but basically Intel needed a method for connecting large amounts of cores, like 28 of them for example. At this core count, the mesh interconnect architecture is superior. However, for 6, 8, and even 10 core CPUs, we already know the mesh interconnect is an inferior solution, and this is why the Core i7, 7800X, 7820X, and 7900X all get smoked by the 8700K when it comes to gaming. 
This is because the 8700K has an average latency of about 40 nanoseconds between cores, whereas the 7800X is more like 70 to 80 nanoseconds. The Ryzen CPUs are a little more complex as the cores within the CCX module have a similar core to core latency to that of the 8700K, and this is regardless of the DDR4 memory speed. However, once you exit the CCX module, the core to core latency increases to around 110 nanoseconds, and that's with DDR4 3200 memory. The CCX to CCX core latency is reduced with faster memory as AMD's Infinity Fabric is tied to the memory clock rate, and lower latency DRAM also helps immensely. Another issue is the games themselves. Almost all games are designed to work on just a few cores, and only now are we starting to see some effort made to try and break tasks up into pieces so that they can be run in parallel. Obviously, prior to AMD's Ryzen release, games were designed and, well, almost exclusively optimized for Intel CPUs, and that meant working with quad cores. That is slowly starting to change now, so Ryzen gaming performance will improve with time, uh, just don't expect it to be wiping the floor with ring bus CPUs anytime soon. Anyway, in terms of IPC performance, AMD has certainly closed up the gap and the improved cache latency has also really helped. There are certainly a number of benefits to buying a second gen Ryzen CPU over a Coffee Lake CPU, so it is going to be exciting to see how the battle unfolds in 2018 and beyond. There's also a number of benefits to Squarespace's all-in-one platform. It allows you to quickly and easily create a beautiful hassle-free website. There's nothing to install, patch or upgrade ever. You don't need to know a thing about stuff like PHP, CSS, HTML. They're all just acronyms for things you don't need to worry about if you build with Squarespace. Their beautiful designer templates make creating a powerful online identity easy. Each template is a starting point for a wide range of projects, whether you're pursuing a side hustle or promoting your main gig. Squarespace also provides award-winning 24-7 customer support. Go to squarespace.com forward slash harbor unboxed, single word, no space, and start your free trial today and receive 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. And that is going to do it for this one. If you did enjoy the video, then be sure to hit the like button for us. Appreciate that. Uh, subscribe for more content. And if you appreciate the work we do at Harper Unbox, then consider supporting us on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I will see you again next time.